Well, welcome everybody to St. Catherine's. Uh, my name is Stephen Connor. I'm the director of CRASH. I've got a couple of bits of information um, for those of you here in the auditorium. Uh, the exit to the lobby uh, is through this door that I'm pointing to on your right and my left. The nearest toilets are in the lobby by the exit on your right. And then you just go down a little, uh, a couple of stairs and the door is activated by a touch button. There are no fire drills planned for today. You may be relieved to hear, but that does mean that if the fire alarm sounds, you should probably take it seriously and evacuate through the nearest exit and assemble by the main gates of the college. We're running this event, as you can see, at a reduced capacity. Uh, face coverings are not mandatory, but are discretionary. Um, and then uh, a couple more uh, housekeeping points for our larger audience. So this event will be recorded uh, and uploaded to Zoom, um, streamed to an audience on that platform. So uh, we assume by attending this event in person or online, you're giving your consent to be included in this recording. Uh, the recording will be available, in fact, uh, on the Mindaru Center for Technology and Democracy and CRASH websites shortly after this event. For those who are joining online, you can frame your questions through the chat function and our moderators will transmit your questions during the Q&A at the end. For those of you here in the room, please raise your hand during Q&A. We'll have some lights up so we can see you and please wait until we bring you a microphone uh, so that we can all hear you. Um, those of you joining us online, we have enabled captioning for this event. So that if you would like to have captioning to accompany the event, you can select that at the bottom of your screen. Um, these captions are provided by Zoom. Uh, I've noticed that Zoom seems incapable of recognizing Shakespeare quotations. Um, and there might be other things for which crash, I'm afraid, cannot be held responsible. Um, and I hope it goes without saying, which means that I'm just about to say it, uh, that we hope to welcome everybody to an inclusive and respectful event in all respects tonight. Um, we'd love it if you could complete a short feedback questionnaire after the event. The link to this survey um, will be sent via Eventbrite. Now, this evening's lecture fulfills two functions. It is the CRASH Anniversary Lecturer, one of the events that we're using to mark 20 years of the Center for Research in Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities, which opened its doors in 2001. Its second function is to be an unofficial inaugural lecture. Uh, unofficial because this is a university that doesn't have inaugural lectures for Professor Gina Neff. One of the puzzling and rather vexatious things about inaugural lectures um, for the universities that have them is the fact that they tend to get so backed up that they end up being given some years after the professor in question has turned up or been elevated. The fact, however, that Cambridge doesn't do inaugural lectures allows us paradoxically to mount one that will actually occur at a time when it can properly be thought to be inaugural. So we are doubly pleased to be able to welcome Gina Neff tonight. She's held positions in UCLA, UC San Diego, the Central Uni European University, and the Department of Communication at the University of Washington, before being appointed as a professor of technology and society at the Oxford Internet Institute. In July of this year, however, we succeeded in inveigling her away to become the executive director of CRASH's Mindaroo Center for Technology and Democracy. Gina is one of the world's leading commentators on the impact of data and digital technologies on social life, especially in the realm of work. She's the author of Venture Labor, Work and the Burden of Risk in Innovative Industries in 2015, a groundbreaking history of conditions of work in digital and technology industries, and the joint author in the following year, 2016, of Self-Tracking, 
a book that investigates what happens when people begin to turn their daily lives, especially their experiences of health and leisure, into data. And a new book, Human-Centered Data Science, an introduction, is due out from MIT Press in early 2022. Gina did not have to come far to give this lecture, but we would have gone a very long way indeed, uh, in any case, to attract her. So we must count ourselves very lucky to have the privilege of having her here tonight to give her lecture, The Cost of Data, Making Sense in Digital Society. Please welcome her. Thank you, Steve. Thank you to all of you and thank you listening on Zoom and watching. What those of you on Zoom can't see is that I'm looking out at an audience for the first time in 19 months. It's pretty great to be here. I've never been so happy to get out of my leisure wear in my life. Never so grateful to put on fancy dress. Um, it's very good to be back. So from steps to clicks to heartbeats to temperature, We've long been quantified, but new and emerging kinds of data now promise to help us all live better lives, get better services from government, connect with more people more authentically, and solve really big, thorny social problems. Now, as a society, we would say we are now data-driven a term that's been used to talk about how organizations transform themselves to think about analysis. As a society, we might though say that this data driven is data saturation, that we might be long on data and short on sense. Data quality engineer, Quality engineer and statistician Edwards Denning once said, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Now it's fitting tonight to be here at a lecture to celebrate the 20th anniversary of CRASH because this is a place where people have long had opinions, interpretations, analyses driven by scholarship and data, but never have people just been just people with opinions. My problem for tonight is raising the question, what if we took account the costs to our societies and to our planet of this data saturation? What if we reconfigured the costs of our data-driven society? What if we took an account in different ways? As a society, we've mistakenly thought that the rise of the data, the digital data around us has come for free. It's been free for the taking, but now we must pay attention to how those costs have come due. Sorry. One of those costs, like Denning said, is who gets to have opinions? Who counts? When do they count? Why do they count? These are choices that don't simply appear, but rather are made through decisions. They're not accidents. Just like data, it's not accidents of a data set who shows up in the data. Now it matters now because the data gathered about us is gather, gathered at speed, scope, and scale that really was unimaginable 20 years ago at the creation of CRASH. Consider, not long after that, that there was a phrase to herald the start of this big data era. Data is the new oil. It's just there for the taking, like oil should be. That's sarcasm if it didn't come across. In the lead up to the UN's conference on climate change, COP26, it may no longer be fashionable to talk as data as oil, but the slogan was overhyped even in the beginning that data can be mined for value. It's still just there for the taking. It's there, a natural seemingly appearing resource. And many authors, many critics have written about this metaphor. But perhaps the better and greener metaphor is really to think of data as hydropower. 
data is not simply there as a natural resource ready to be used or manipulated. It, things have to be built around it, infrastructure, in order to make it valuable. Data also need both interpretation and application to the world. Data needs sense. Data need to be made sense of. In other words, like hydro powder, power, data aren't simply found. Data are always made, always made because they're made sense of. Now, the organizational psychologist Carl Weick has referred to a process he calls sense making. And I don't know about you, but I've been thinking a lot about sense making over the last 19 months of the global pandemic. A sense making is how people come together to collectively understand what is going on in situations of uncertainty. Now, Weick's examples and the examples that I used for my research and my teaching were always great. Like, you know, these are wonderful kinds of examples that we had at hand, but consider what all of us collectively have been through when it comes to data in the last 19 months. What is going on in our world? What risks do I face? Are my children at risk? Is my family at risk? Am I at risk now? Weick teaches us that sense-making is a process that's collective and it never comes simply from objective data that's outside of us, that it's something that we internalize. We use different heuristics and rules of thumb to make sense of the world around us. Even in a dated, saturated society, we need to make sense. And never more than the last 19 months have we seen how data come to matter. Data don't simply appear. We make sense or we don't at our own peril. But making sense of data takes work, an extraordinary amount of work, actually. I've been thinking about data for the last decade with my collaborator, Carrie Skirt Stosik, on how data and construction have been used. Now, we've been studying a tool to make databases of buildings, it's very fashionable now to call them digital twins, that um, can be used in the construction process, can help coordinate and um, uh, negotiate work more seamlessly. And somehow in the beginning of the you know, run up to the tool that we are studying, that the assumption was that the, these data that would be shared seamlessly, uh, magically across various companies and actors involved in large scale construction, would just kind of magically happen. Um, these new kinds of databases would simply transform the industry. The intermediate steps of how, who was doing the interpretation, how the data would come to matter, simply never got addressed. Nor did the questions of how are we going to create these organizational transformations in a globally dispersed and networked industry that works simply project by project by project. And so that um, work, which we um, have spent too long on and, and wonderful Zoom calls over the pandemic on, um, is, is a work of negotiated adoption. How people within their jobs come to understand what data helps them get their work done and what new practices they need to put in place to make that data matter in an everyday situation. With Naya Moeller and Katie Pine, I've been working on how new kinds of data um, are rolled out in healthcare settings. And here too, we see the process of what we've called data work, making large scale uh, data sets in healthcare involve enormous kinds of new, new data, that new work about data that we haven't considered as part of data science. Consider the clerics, the clerical workers, who are the frontline workers of every AI artificial intelligence system in healthcare. If healthcare data is notoriously well annotated, like my co-panelist today in a AI and healthcare management session said, if healthcare data is so wonderfully well annotated, it's because of thousands of workers 
who see the work of data as part of the work of us as patients. Now, these kinds of data can make sense in our own lives as well. I got started in this work thinking about self-tracking data, and it's been a delight over the pandemic to move from the work that we did in self-tracking in 2016 to ask how are people during the pandemic keeping track of their health and fitness, wearing devices not unlike the one that I wear, many of you wear. Jamie Freeman and Blake DeCosla and I have been asking people in Australia, the US and the UK, what is it that you're keeping track of? What matters to you and who are you making sense of this data with? These kinds of data pose enormous transformative opportunities for companies, for people, for our lives. And if I could only package the excitement and the enthusiasm of talking to people after months of lockdown about what their Fitbit means to them. Mary from the Midlands, raising her arms in victory, saying, yes, every time my Fitbit buzzes, I feel a little joy. Now, that's an opportunity to talk to somebody about what it is they see as important, what it is they value in their data. So this kind of work that it takes to make our data-driven society isn't simply happening in back offices, though it is, isn't simply happening in the large-scale data labeling and tagging work that happens through long global supply chains of labor. It's happening how we each make sense with ourselves, with our loved ones, of the data around us. But these new data systems are like social experiments, huge ones. And we don't really know the outcomes of these experiments yet. So in our construction project, a new kind of data system was literally plopped down and said, okay, guys, guys, mainly, figure it out. Let people figure out what this data is going to mean. If we talk about the ethics and choices of people who are making large scale data systems in our society, we have to consider how individuals at the end points of those systems also make choices, how people use them, how they misuse them, how they misunderstand them. Will these systems lead to more surveillance or worse jobs? Will they help outsource misery and harms onto other people? Will they take protections and benefits from the powerful? Will they harm the less powerful? Can we feel some solidarity with people whose labor goes in to ensuring that our, our recommendation systems, our Netflix recommendation systems are clean? and not smutty. Now, feminist scholars have long pointed out that some of the most important types of work in society are those that are um, unpaid, undervalued by society. And the work that we do to care for our families and our communities is undercounted. And we can see the same kind of echoes in the economic data about data systems. The care that people take to make sure and ensure that our data systems work and function are literally undercounted. It's simply, there's simply too much about these large scale data systems that we don't yet know. We don't yet know how they're impacting women's work, for example. And with Clemmy Collette, we're running a project with UNESCO, the OECD and the Inter-America Development Bank to ask these questions. What are AI's impact on women in the workforce? Will job hiring algorithms be biased against women? We simply don't know. Some evidence suggests yes. Will communication and tracking software be biased against women's voices? Again, emerging evidence suggests perhaps. If we look at the composition of large scale language models, the models that drive the recommendation systems from Amazon's Echo and Alexa to all of our smartphone recommendation systems, if we look at those large scale data models, we see that they're based on some of the worst corners of the internet. 
with language that's discriminatory and defamatory. Now again, emerging evidence suggests that perhaps new kinds of skills are gonna be needed to make these systems work and make them make sense. And yet there's still much we do not yet know. Here's what we do know. That social and political decisions always shape when data matters. Again, I'm speaking to an audience in 2021 where I don't need to tell you we've had a massive experiment, a massive conversation in how data comes to matter, which data matter in warring kinds of data. And the fact that perhaps we're standing here when the UK represents 20% of the global coronavirus cases today um, tells us that data get judged in different ways at different times. Now, the challenge is that myself, you, all of us, those listening on Zoom, um, we have these traces of our online actions and how those traces come to matter as data are rarely transparent to us as users. Now, there's enormous power imbalances in who has the capacity to analyze and collect such data. And rarely are those people, those actors, those companies accountable to society. But very much these data are shaped by the social and political contexts that they are in. As an empirical social scientist, it pains me to say this almost but that the notion that we are living in a world in which we're holding data up as having a kind of validity and a kind of objectivity while we're living in a world where that data is socially constructed. So my work as a sociologist of technology means that my work looks at how societies and institutions work, as opposed to necessarily how individuals or behavioral uh, features of any new technology or emerging data, data work. So I'm really interested in the big society questions rather than necessarily answering the questions that the new kinds of data can help us answer at the individual level. Now, data, as we've seen, have enormous potential to help people realize <clears throat> how they can remake the terms of collaboration on both cognitive and institutional levels. But data are always fundamentally social and communicative in nature. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, the data require, they always require conveying an intended meaning through a process of encoding representation. So the world encoded into data, decoding, data meaning something about the world, transmitting my telling you about the data, reception, you hearing about the data, and then you finally making an interpretation. So this is a process that we know well in the, in the field of communication. Um, data also involve this process of, of production, circulation, and reception, just like any other cultural or knowledge product. Now, if that seems a little abstract, the move that I'm making is this. The difference between the kinds of data that we think of as driving our science and the kinds of data that we see as fueling our entertainment have a very fine line in terms of these mechanisms, in terms of these processes. If we wanna understand the socio-material nature of large-scale data or how people, teams, and companies make sense and communities make sense of data, we need the theory and method tools that help us see that data are the world made sense and we make sense with data. So that there is this dualism, that the data aren't somehow separate or outside or ever possible um, without that sense-making process. Now, what I mean by this is we communicate with data and we data act as a kind of medium through which we tell our stories. Think about Mary in the West Midlands, raising her arms in victory over her Fitbit data. Now, the challenge is what Daniel, the historian, Daniel Rosenberg has put, 
that when we use the word data, we are always using a rhetorical sledgehammer. Data always is used as a concept that means something before fact. It means I'm not arguing. I don't have an opinion. I have data. There's something different when we use that term data. Data, as Rosenberg writes, are before the fact. But there are these powerful asymmetries and these, this, these power differences in who gets to make claims with data, I would argue are getting worse. The data are not transparent how they're produced and they're not transparent how they are analyzed and fundamental questions about our health, our kids, our democracies, our planet are left to, to those not who have opinions, but manage the data. And so this brings me to really the three points I wanna make in my talk tonight, which is first, the idea of data's costs to society. Now we know that data have an enormous um, amount of work and effort that go into making the large scale models that fuel our world. In a report that we did with um, uh, the Future Says initiative of the Mindaroo Foundation last year, this was with Nayana Prakash and Maggie McGrath. Um, we looked at these long global supply chains of the labeling data and work that it takes to make AI systems. And, and what we found was something that's really useful. We, we went through and looked at all the newspaper articles that suggested that there was a problem with an AI system. And I highly recommend this exercise to all of you actually, um, because we found that these failures that were listed were not because of technical issues. Rather, they occurred because there was a, some kind of misunderstanding between what people thought was happening in a large scale data system like a company's um, uh, engineering process or a hospital's diagnostic process. There was a big misunderstanding between what they thought the system was saying and what the system actually said or did. Um, broadly, the errors we noticed were in three categories. They fell into problems of transparency where you couldn't understand if a large scale data system were at play. Um, integration where workers and organizations didn't quite have the stitching together of these systems into their processes leading to either um, the third failure, either over or under reliance on those systems. Um, we advocated in this report for really an expanded definition of transparency, not to understanding how the large scale data systems around us are being working or the technical working, but really to think about an open dialogue between organizations and the rest of us about what our data systems do, who does the work of those systems and where the work happens in relationship to how the recommendations or outputs are made. This brings me to my second point that I want to make tonight. Large scale data systems have a cost to our ability for society to govern and set the terms of its rules to hold actors to account. What are we willing collectively to accept in an algorithmically parsed system? And what are we willing to accept in giving up the ability to hold to account the results of those systems? One of the problems that we have is that these systems are building new kinds of infrastructure that transfer power from one set of actors to another. Consider, as I often do, Amazon Web Services. Now, chances are pretty good. If the lights were up and if the Zoom were on, if I were on Zoom, I might do a Zoom poll at the moment. Um, I would say, how many of you think you used Amazon Web Services today? Um, because when we 
look at the backbone of the internet, when we look at the backbone of what is called the cloud, we see powerful actors like Amazon who have created new kinds of privatized infrastructure that's almost impossible, virtually impossible to avoid. Perhaps you think you want to not use Amazon for their streaming services or their book services, and instead you turn on the BBC iPlayer. The BBC pays $8 million a month for Amazon Web Services. Maybe you want to watch Netflix, $18 million a month to Amazon Web Services. This has made Amazon um, incredibly wealthy over uh, uh, and by some accounts, their web services um, division is growing faster. The profits are growing faster than the other divisions of the company. And we only need to look strategically to see who Jeff Bezos has named as his successor as CEO. Not someone in product, not someone on the, um, on the books or services side of the company but the head of Amazon Web Services, Andy Jassy. And so we have the situation in which the infrastructure that's being built is privatized. Now, the, the AI, the AI um, researcher, Stuart Russell, has talked about a metaphor for how these large scale data systems come to matter in our lives. He's talked about the metaphor of asphalt. And he said, it's like this. Imagine you have engineers who are really good at making asphalt. And they say, well, I'm really good at making asphalt. You know what? I should make, we should have asphalt pavement on this road and that beach and your back garden and your front lawn. That's where asphalt should go. And we would be in an uproar because we would want some voice and say and how that infrastructure is built, who can use it, what they pay for it, and will any of it be available for people who need it? What are we willing to accept in an algorithmically parsed society? So this everyday infrastructure is, um, it's also a wonderful metaphor because in science and technology studies, which I draw from some of my uh, theoretical um, toolkit, we, we really care about looking at the infrastructures that society builds. But unlike the asphalt of the 20th century, today's technological asphalt, today's technological infrastructure is harder for us to see. It's harder for us to see that practically everyone listening this evening has used an infrastructure straight through Amazon, an infrastructure that helps fuel private trips to the moon, to space. Now, if we want to continue to think about what kind of society we want to live in, we need to hold infrastructure to account. And we need to think about and how we communicate these technical configurations, these technical choices, and these challenges to more audiences and more people. Talk about AWS brings me to the 300,000 times problem. That is, we haven't talked about data's cost to the environment. Now, if I were giving this talk last week, the number 300,000 times would stick out in our mind because that's how fast the amount of computing power, compute power has grown from the first of the very large AI system models in 2012 to now, until this week. Billions of parameters or variables, let's call them in more common language, billions of parameters to build systems that make marginal increases in their productivity. Now, let's be clear. 
these advances at the edge of science are bringing us extraordinary discovery. And yet, they're coming at a certain and most definite cost. Who is raising the question and holding to account when are those costs? If we keep as a model the idea that data clean in the cloud is free, then we miss the fact that it takes tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions, to simply train up the large scale models that parse these data. What are the environmental costs of doing this? Now, one researcher, a linguistics, a linguistics professor, estimated that the cost of training one of her linguistics models was not an edge of the art model, very simple, um, estimated that it was over um, 20, it would have taken 27 years on our home computers, on a home computer, about 27 years or almost 10,000 GPUs to train the latest model that she used for a research paper. There are only a few places with that kind of infrastructure built. What are we doing as a society when the edge of our science is dependent upon a kind of research infrastructure that someone controls the keys to? What are we doing as a society when we're training more models with more data at greater costs with servers worrying when we could be asking, what is it that we want to know? And is it worth it? So who counts and what counts? in our digital society today and for our future is a question that we need to consider. It's an urgent one. And that's why I am so grateful and thankful that I have the opportunity tonight to be here with you today to help get us thinking about what it might mean for us to ask different questions about the kind of data saturated society that we want to live in. So where can we go from here? Well, I'd like to talk for a few minutes, the last few minutes of my, of my talk, um, about what we're doing at the University of Cambridge Mindaroo Center for Technology and Democracy. We have four initiatives. And lo and behold, they map on nicely to what I've talked about tonight. We have the challenge to take on directly the public understanding of technology to hold to account the kinds of systems in our everyday life and to help people understand their powers, their rights, their responsibilities, and the choices that we might have different kinds of conversations about what we want our digital society to look like. We have an initiative on trust that helps us think about what's happening in our public systems, what's happening to our governments and to our trust in one another when we increasingly mediate our lives through online systems that aren't built for civic engagement. They're not built for helping secure <laughs> elections or democracies. They're not built for keeping us in the dark. We have an initiative on the environmental costs of data where we're thinking about the social and material infrastructures that go into our technologically mediated worlds to start to ask different kinds of questions if we can have safer and more efficient data systems, if we can have data systems that work for us rather than taxing our planet and our resources. And finally, we have an initiative on the future of work because the future of work is here now and we can see it in the corners where we have invisible labor that's responsible for building the systems that seem so apparent to us, so trans, so, so clean, so simple, and yet built on so many with so much invisible 
and undervalued labor? What if we ask different kinds of questions about who's moderating our online social media to make sure that it's safe? What if we thought about what makes a good, good job and what good work is going to look like in the future? And so with that, I'm pleased to um, be working with an amazing team of researchers, Hugo Liao, Julia Rone, Hunter Vaughn, Louise Hickman, our first four researchers who have joined us at the Mindaroo Center. We've just launched, and I'm so excited to be here, but I have to say I'm daunted by the enormity of our task, that we must absolutely begin to have different kinds of conversations about the kinds of ways we want to use data to make our world better, to make our lives better, to make our families safer, to make our worlds a little brighter. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention tonight and turn it over to Eve to help us moderate in the discussion. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll take some questions, maybe group some together from here if we have them, um, and then we'll turn to Jeremy, who will be able to uh, feed in some questions from our online audience. Who would like to start here in the room? Yes. Um, could, <laughs> can you wait for the microphone to arrive? Here it comes. I'm on. Oh, great. That's so we can hear on the Zoom as well. They won't be able to hear you without the mic. Is it working? Yeah. Uh, I'm asking you about monetization and data, and that seems to be an increase in trend all the time. People are determined to monetize everything. And have you looked at this sort of um, this um, well, metric? Yeah. One of my favorite. Um, stories from the self-tracking book is when I was at a, a cafe in the other Cambridge in Massachusetts, and it was in a neighborhood where all the tech companies are located, and, and somebody had very urgently asked me um, to come and meet with him because he had, he had just left a luxury brand, um, a sporting brand manufacturer, and he was coming into a tech company, and he said, I have no idea what we're going to do with all this data. And I thought, okay, this is really curious. First, um, this is the tech company is asking me as a researcher. They really must not know what they're doing if they're if they're if they're coming down to me. Um, but second, the, the the idea that you would design and build a product, and in this case, it was a wearable watch as a device, you design and build a product, thinking and buying into the idea that the monetization of data is is inevitable, that it's easy, that data are this you know, business model, that you know, data are the business model, right? Get the data and you'll figure it out. Um, you know, if he if he didn't, if they didn't know that going into the product design and development, what what was their plan? And so I think that we have to be really careful when we think about monetization of data, that that we have many situations in which asking how data come to matter is not the question that we start to do. It's like, well, we've got data, it must be valuable. If it's like oil sitting there in the ground, all we have to do is extract it and it will make meaning. Um, it, you know, time and again, we can see that that might not be the case. And so what I'm advocating for is that we um, push to ensure that we're asking what kinds of data, what kinds of questions, what kinds of things, and then for as consumers and citizens, we're asking, how do we want the data about us to be used? How do we want to see that advocacy and our representation in the world come to matter? A couple more gentlemen here and then uh, who can you reach? Ah, oh, and uh, lady there who you happen to be closest to, Irene. Hi, I, I really agree with a lot of the things you're saying, but there's just one bit that doesn't quite sit right, which is, we talk about the cost of having the data to society, but 
before we had the data, we had a huge cost of a very small amount of people making all kinds of decisions, which were even less transparent because at least now we can all see that the thing was, so with AI, it goes a bit further, but let's just not think about AI for a second and just think about the data collection. Is there any work that's been done to kind of that comparison? Like, well, what is the cost of us, us not having, now having data versus the cost that it was before of this uh, small group of people making these decisions, which I guess were somewhat questionable. Maybe we think that because we could ask humans questions, but they weren't questionable because those people were in power and, and there's nothing for us to do. And then I, I just want to see like the Delta, like I know the power has shifted, but have we actually gained or are we just losing in different ways? Maybe I could flip that just a little bit and say, when we look at large scale data systems, are we seeing power? And there are many wonderful examples of how data in the hands of individuals can be life-changing and transformative. We tell a, a, a case in the self-tracking book of um, in, uh, community activists who wanted to prove that there was environmental pollution happening and a, and a racially uh, biased environmental pollution happening in their community. And being able to work with um, a set of researchers who set up um, environmental sensors, air quality sensors, helped them make the case that they needed to do more epidemiological data in that community. And we've seen also in the pandemic, wonderful examples and cases of grassroots examples of people coming together, sharing, collect, collecting and sharing and analyzing and making sense of data that helps them make arguments that get framed in certain ways. But if we're living in a society that only listens to data and doesn't listen to experience, then we're missing incredible opportunities. And, and then if we are placing a magical thinking into the hands of um, companies making choices, for how the data are collected, analyzed, framed, and presented, then we better make sure that those companies are representing larger or widely held societal views than they are at the moment. So I certainly don't want a group of, you know, today's engineers alone, as they are, making the kinds of choices that are going to build into infrastructure that we're going to be living with for the next two decades. Right? So I think we've got work to do on that. That's a good question. Thank you. So we have one more here. And, and perhaps if we could take take two, two questions, um, one from a gentleman here, and then I think it's the same row, um, the gentleman in green, and then we'll, we'll go to our online audience. Thank you, please. So I was thinking a little bit about this sort of debate that's happening in a, in a few legislatures about things like rules as co uh, laws as, as code and then thinking about the ways that uh, and, and comparing that with what you were talking about with sort of public public cloud like there's a there are things that push people in particular directions within a democratic context to reach for the same efficiencies that they see that they see perhaps within the private sector and I'm wondering here about within the mission of the organization here, how do you seek to reframe the debate around what's important within a democratic context, considering that, you know, we have lots of forays within sort of think tanks, academia, and public policy settings into spaces that whilst interesting, uh, open up huge problematic um, recessions into, into inscrutable government but at the same time also have had possibilities for much more open government. And I, I, I like the reframing around public infrastructure and, and green, but I'm, I'm interested as to how you can seek to alter that debate, especially when so many organizations, especially in the UK, have risen and fallen over the last decade on a, on a similar uh, framing. My <laughs> microphone along the row, thank you. Yes, hello. Thank you so much for the fascinating talk. Um, if I understood your talk correctly, it was, uh, or you presented as a sociology, not just of domination, but also of emancipation. So I found that very exciting. But my question 
um, is uh, about the tech industry's recent moves or also the discourse around tech, which has appropriated a lot of critical issues you brought, you brought up today. So about environmental um, concerns, about political purpose, about uh, economic transformation, about a new world of work. So I, I was wondering, I mean, of course, this is only a discourse, but uh, still I was wondering how should we as social scientists react to this, I guess, appropriation of critique, which is happening in the tech industry in particular. So I'm gonna play that back and I think the two questions will be well combined. So the idea is um, the tech industry uses this kind of language as well. Is that what you mean by appropriation? They've taken on the Yeah, let's, I think, uh, you know, the environmental issue is a, is a great one. You know, um, Amazon is one of the, Amazon and Facebook are two of the world's largest purchasers of green energy. Is that a good thing? Um, well, yes, it's great that they are um, buying greener energy. They're, they're greener than most nation states in terms of the percentage of renewables and they have goals of being 100% renewable. But at what cost, and at what cost to local grids and in different places and without the public investment in infrastructure that they could be making. And so it's one thing to say, yes, we are as a company going carbon neutral or we are buying renewable energy. It's another thing to, to make these kinds of choices that say, should we be making a 535 billion parameter data model that is, is that is that where the state of the art should be at today? And should we be at that state of the art when the possibility for the improvement of those data models is, is, is at this point incremental? We're seeing an exponential growth in the amount of energy spent on training up these kinds of models and an incremental growth in how the efficiency of the ability to answer in those. Is that a trade-off that's worth it? That question was volatile enough to um, get researchers at Microsoft in trouble for posing that question. Oh, sorry, researchers at Google in trouble for posing that question. Should we be investing so rapidly and quickly in the expansion of these things? And so, I think the appropriation of the kind of language of a clean, um, wonderful future of work, a clean, wonderful future planet is part of the narrative around technology that we need to, to be critically questioning. Um, there's wonderful allies that we have who work um, with and across various companies. There's wonderful ways that we can make some change happen prag pragmatically and tangibly. But we have to be very careful that we're not buying into an idea that our future is, as Jathan Sandowski calls it, the future of Amazonianism, that we're living in a new kind of industrial era, not unlike Fordism of the 19th and 20th century, that is driven by the backbone of having a data-rich cloud controlled by just a handful of global entities. In terms of where we fit, yes, there's many different organizations that um, we would see as our allies in doing this kind of work. I think we have um, a wonderful advantage in that we are situated here at Cambridge that gives us a bit more room to think, explore, grow. We've got the best team of um, researchers in the world who have joined us to think through and creatively attack these problems. So, so we're not set up as a traditional think tank where we're going to have policy outputs, but we get to really think blue sky, how is it that we would change this world and what would we do for better? We haven't heard from our online. No, we're, we're, we want to try to wrap up, you know, pretty much around six o'clock. So I'm gonna invite um, Jeremy, if he could, um, twist some of our questions into an attractive bouquet uh, that you might want to or address. Or near. <laughs> ah. I'll try my best. Um, a question actually on, on Amazon, um, the point from Austin Choi Fitzpatrick, who says, um, with the issue of Amazon that you mentioned, is the, re is the solution regulation um, or replacement by national infrastructure or, or something else completely? What do you think the solution is? 
Austin, that's a great question. Um, hi, Austin. I'm glad you're listening. Um, yeah, so what do we do? Do we throw the baby out with the bathwater? Um, Austin and others who might be on Zoom and some of you in the room might know that I would be, I'm actually one of the last people to say, break them all down and throw them away. So I love my social media. I'm not get, giving up Facebook anytime soon. I've just said that on the record. Um, I absolutely positively think we as societies need to hold the companies to account. And we need to make sure that we have um, public and accountable oversight into the choices and decisions that are made. Um, you know, at this point, in terms of building different kinds of infrastructure, then the, I saw an, a recent experiment that costed out what running an alternative to Google Maps would be. So imagine um, Janet Vertessi, the sociologist Janet Vertessi at, at Princeton, did a wonderful set of experiments around privacy and tried to um, replace everything in her life from the big five tech companies. So, you know, no using Google Maps, no using social media, no using um, Gmail, et cetera. Um, so a similar experiment was imagine taking an alternative to Google Maps, which again, uh, I used to find where St. Katz is. I don't know. I, I don't know how many of you have used Google Maps today, but you know, really useful tool. Most of us have it on their phone, um, have it on our phones. Do, should we simply say, let's give it up and go for a local different alternative? That's really hard to do. So an, an online, a recent online experiment that did this akin to Janet's um, privacy experiments um, found that if you were to design it, a very simple system using OpenStreetMaps, a fantastic available tool, um, and to make it so that your phone doesn't ping um, while you're out, so it uses less data while you're out, right? Um, wonderful total of Amazon Web Services hosting of 24000 dollars a month. Great. And found another data service to do it for $2,000 a month. So, you know, just even thinking about building a small system, um, scalable by one person, able to be deployed on one phone, um, ends up very quickly um, adding into cloud infrastructure and cloud computing quite extensive terms. So what do we need to do? We absolutely need to be thinking about how we build publicly accountable alternatives. Um, how, and, and that's through legislation, and that's through thinking about what kinds of futures we want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a question here from Mar Hicks. Do you have any advice for people who teach undergraduates in CS, which I think must be computer science? How might these issues be integrated into the curriculum, and what ways can you help them push back against the extractive norms? Thank you for that great question, Mar. I would say there's this fabulous new book called Your Computer is on Fire, which Mar wrote, co-wrote, co-edited. Um, you know, there's, but, but in all seriousness, um, there's one school of thought that says, let's teach computer scientists ethics. That's a program I would argue is bound to fail. Absolutely will fail. Why? Because I firmly and strongly believe that we as individuals alone cannot change powerful institutions, that we as individuals need collective action to do that. And so instead of thinking about training the individual CS students in ethics, although please take that work on, we must be thinking about how do we build in more collective solutions that help redress these problems. And again, from the historical perspectives and the, and the post-colonial perspectives in your computer is on fire, we see some of those choices and some of those, some of those options, right? So what might that look like? Does it look like professional standards bodies like the International Electrical Engineering um, Standards Body, IEEE? If it does it look like those international standards bodies um, playing a more active role in, in the ethics of these large-scale data systems? Does it look like new kinds of scholarly hybrid practitioner communities, like the FACT conference that's come out 
as a collaboration between researchers and those doing ethics work in large companies, um, helping to build new kinds of language and new kinds of theoretical tools together. Um, does it look like new kinds of organizations like um, Black in AI and women in AI who take on some of these structural inequalities of the computing industry and say, hey, what about us? What kinds of futures can we build? We need seats at the table so that we build better systems. That's the kind of thing I want our, 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 our students of today, our undergraduates of today to be, be, be taught to do, not just to make good decisions for themselves in the moment, but to think about how, how institutional power works and how to change that. Thank you. Well, um, inaugurations are called that because it's a time when you check that the auguries are good. I think in classical Rome, it probably had something to do with the flight of birds. Um, but from where I'm sitting, they look pretty good for the Mindaroo Center. I hope you agree from what we've heard um, tonight. Uh, I want to thank our online audience. I want to thank you for coming out tonight. And I want to invite you to follow our work at the Mindaroo Center at uh, mctd.ac.uk or through the CRASH website. And finally, uh, to thank yourselves and thank Gina Neff for her talk.